Hi guys, thank you for joining us. I'm Natalie from Positive Leaf Primal and I'm also the founder and president of DC Shoopy Inu Rescue. We got in a new allergy dog. Her name is Zuki and a lot of you have asked what do we do in our program. I have to preface that we'll be going over small sections and we consider everything we go over to be a tool in a toolbox. Just like to build a house you need wood and nails and hammer you know if you don't have the hammer you can't build the house so we're not saying that any one of these things in and of itself is a panacea for um, underlying issues but they are all part of a broader spectrum of building up the immune system, removing toxins from the environment so that benign antigens don't create a host of hyperimmune responses. So there's three core philosophies to our organization which all tie into the cornerstone of uh, a healthy microbiome and that is uh, training nutrition and wellness in the environment the microbiome is a cornerstone of our organization is that as i mentioned everything's going to be tied to the microbiome all the research is coming out of there is just incredible worldwide that's where all the pharmaceutical companies are putting their money into so you're going to be hearing about this you're going to be seeing this there's micro-based therapeutics coming out it is a massive paradigm shift of how we will be approaching health. It's no longer the silos of medicine where the gastroenterologist doesn't talk to the, the neurologist. This is now all being tied together thanks to the microbiome. Our nutrition aspect, which is a big part of it and sometimes misconstrued as a panacea for all ailments, is a species appropriate, nutrient dense, diverse and rotated, clean, raw diet. Every word in that sentence has a plethora of scientific evidence, which we will be going through in great detail further down the road. This video should be less scientific, <laughs> just covering some basics as we focus on a small environment. I also want to cover the history of the program and the organization so you get a little background about where all of this came from. About six years ago, I had one dog and a couple cats and I was feeding kibble. I was doing annual vaccinations per my veterinarian. I was doing all the monthly feed and ticks. I was very busy with work, but I was a uh, a good pet owner as far as our traditional allopathic approach to medicine. Lots of over vaccination and lots of drugs until I got my second dog, uh, Katniss, who after cluster vaccinations um, developed uh, severe atopic dermatitis, pulled out all her fur, was bloody, and I I thought it was a horrible owner. I mean, I was feeding the best of the best high-end kibble. That's the five-star standard. Um, there was no junk. Uh, I didn't understand how this dog, seemingly at one-year-old healthy, went completely bald and bloody. And of course, I took her to my veterinarian and I was prescribed over a thousand dollars of antibiotics, steroids, specially designed serums. Uh, her uh, highest allergy uh, was me it's, and is, is human dander. And her second highest allergen is yellow dock, which is the number one weed in the state of Virginia. So whether she was indoor or outdoors, it wasn't a good scenario. I was told to basically scrub my skin like in the movie Gattaca, make sure all my human flakes were off any covers, blankets, frequently wash them. And I was also told that she would progressively get worse and worse and worse as she got older. I took all the drugs home. I'm, not, I'm upset. I'm, I think, oh, what have I done to this dog? It just seemed so odd that something, a benign antigen, could create such a severe bloody um, bald response out of nowhere. I, I dove deep into literature into human immunology and I spent a lot of time with my head and journal articles trying to figure out what causes this and how can we manage and, and mediate this and will she get worse until she's old and bald and her liver's destroyed from all the steroids and her microbiome's destroyed from all the antibiotics. That's the basic origin of the uh, allergy program for DC Shiba Inu Rescue. I still have the thousand dollars of drugs in my refrigerator. I use them for uh, example presentations. Um, she hasn't gotten worse and uh, if she's our neutral testing dog for the organization, she would go from having multiple outbreaks a year, um, the first couple of years, 
to nothing. Uh, now I, I do titers, I don't uh, over vaccinate, I just titer and do rabies per law. I no longer use any of the monthly broad spectrum topical toxins. Uh, I was already environmentalist, uh, a lead AP leadership in energy environmental design, uh, greening our buildings in Washington DC at lead standards. So my environment has already been extremely clean and I've always had an interest in inorganic gardening as a gardener. So there's a lot of things that I want to share with you within their environment that we can do to reduce the toxic load. And it's not that one in and of itself is particularly uh, the danger, but it could be the trigger for your dog based on epigenetics, based on stress or environmental toxin loads. So that's what we'll be going over in this weekly series of what do we do? And if you can't mediate everything, at least you can be aware of potential issues for your immunocompromised or allergy dog. A little bit about the background with DC Shiba Inu Rescues uh, quote unquote allergy program and we use that term as just so people understand it whether you know we want to say canine atopic dermatitis or whatever intestinal permeability or whatever uh, terminology we use that uh, which isn't the appropriate scientific terminology because it's not particularly an allergy it's just a a term that we use to identify uh, dogs like this who are bald and sick. Since Katniss, we've taken in hundreds of dogs, but we've had a 100% success rate treating the most severe atopic dermatitis without ever using antibiotic steroid serums, antihistamines, things that would disrupt, destroy the microbiome, destroy the liver, compromise and suppress the immune system as well as the symptoms, and we do something completely different. We build the immune system, we look at the terrain, we build build up their ability to handle benign antigens in the environment to the point that, for example, I don't remove myself from my dog's environment, yet she has no symptomatic outward issues of me or Yellow Doc being in her environment because her immune system is so strong. That's not to say she isn't highly stressed, um, you know, has a bad diet or something happens or an injury. She'll be more susceptible to environmental hits than maybe one of my other dogs who are he can basically, maybe like Wolfie can eat rocks, he'll be totally fine. So the rescue about six years ago, this was when we made a fundamental change. We used to feed all kibble. Um, the allergy incident happened with my dog and I immediately changed um, to raw to start doing research and I saw a huge difference. Unfortunately, people think, oh, I threw some raw down for my dog. My dog's not cured. That's stupid. It didn't work. That's not how it works. Again, these are tools in a toolbox. Raw diet in and of itself is not a panacea, and it may not be sufficient for the underlying issue. However, it is essential as a foundation. So you're building that house. You need a strong foundation. The diet is a strong foundation. It's not an inflammatory diet. It doesn't have heterocyclic amine. It doesn't have cancer-causing carcinogens. We want to do a low inflammatory diet and we want diversity. We've got to build up the microbiome. And we know that the number one predictor of health across species is a diverse microbiome because there are over 6,500 functions of the bacteria in the gut. That's including 80% that regulates the immune system. There's a bidirectional relationship between the gut and the brain via the vagus nerve. It assimilates nutrients. It digests the B vitamins, D, K, E, your fat-soluble vitamins. It um, metabolizes drugs. These are all foreign bacteria that do this work for us. So the more beneficial bacteria bacteria, if one gets wiped out by an antibiotic, there are 400 more, 300 more that will do that same job as opposed to like a monoculture of the, the microbiome where you wipe out uh, a bacteria that was assimilating your B vitamins and there's nothing else to take its place. So then you have massive deficiencies. So we go back to the dogs that started coming into our rescue. So we were feeding high-end, five-star, you know, the best of the best kibble in some foster homes, and then some homes were feeding raw. And what we ended up seeing was that when a foster would go on vacation, we moved a kibble-fed dog into a raw-fed home without any medication. We saw senior dogs 
starting to run upstairs, jumping on couches, no medication, just the change of diet. At that point, we made a huge change in the organization and said, that's it, no more kibble. We cannot ethically say you are going to get a subpar diet and not do as well as the home that is feeding raw. So our organization six years ago said we will be 100% raw feeding and every home, we go through extensive training for all our foster homes, no one's allowed to buy any food. We provide all the food, all the treats, all the supplementation because we are very controlling about every piece of food that goes into our rescue's mouth. The number one cost in this organization is our veterinary bills. The number two is the food. And the food ultimately reduces those long-term veterinary bills, as you'll see. Since then, we have had hundreds of, of rescues, um, not just allergies, but we see within 30 days, I mean, our fosters who aren't, they don't have to feed raw, they have to feed our dog raw, but they'll see our dogs change within 30 days and say, hey, maybe I should do that with my dog. And they change on their own because they see the difference. They feel the coat. They see the dander go. They see even um, behavior changes, which there's amazing research going into. You have Ted Dinahan, uh, John Cryan's group, uh, Caltech, where they're looking at the bi-directional relationship between the gut and brain via the vagus nerve. Really incredible research going on there in the microbiome. That was a fundamental change in our organization. There's no transition. 100% of our dogs go into a species appropriate nutrient dense for some rotated clean raw diet squeaky toys. It may not be uh, sufficient, but it is essential. We have um, like an allergy playlist where you can see some of the most severe uh, cases that we've had. And there's baseline data to these dogs. Some of these dogs have 10 years of antibiotics and steroids and they never got better. And it wasn't until they came into our program, it didn't happen overnight. You know, we live in a fast food society with a magic pill mentality. Everybody sees the commercials for the drug that's gonna cure everything. Um, you might get 10 other symptoms, but that's not how this works. There are underlying issues from for every dog, from lipopolysaccharide, intestinal dysbiosis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, candida. I mean, we could go on and on and on. So fermentation can exasperate. One one issue, we have to look at uh, the whole animal. There's dozens and dozens of those severe cases, how they have gone from a lifetime of drugs, some as young as eight months old to 10 years, never getting better until they come to us. And what, again, I have to say what makes it unique is that we never use antibiotic steroids and serums, these things that destroy the immune system, destroy the microbiome, destroy the liver, and make it harder and harder for that dog to ever become healthy. People see a dog like Zuki and, and sometimes they are neglected, but oftentimes they're not. We don't just take rescues, we also counsel people. So we'll give them resources for training and nutrition if they can afford it or have time and whatnot. And uh, people think, oh, they were completely neglected. Uh, what horrible owners. And this isn't always about horrible owners. It's about a broken system. It's about a veterinary industry that pushes drugs that destroy the dog's health and keeps them in a cycle of sickness over the health of the animal. For Zuki, I know some people said, oh, she, she wasn't taken care of. Um, I spoke to the owner and I got all of her pa paperwork. She's a six-year-old dog. And I had over 90 pages um, faxed to me from vets vet after vet after vet, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars, drug after drug after drug. This goes all the way back to when she was a small puppy. I think, I, I can't remember the exact date, but it was before the age of one, they started her on antibiotics and steroids. Before the age of one. Not trying to address the underlying issue. Here's some drugs. You know, they're handed out like candy. The CDC says that antibiotics are overused in human medicine, 30 to 50%, it's probably 70. Um, and it's even worse uh, in, in the veterinary industry. Um, I've been to nearly every vet appointment of 200 some dogs in our organization, um, 300, but I don't go to all of them. And I can't tell you how many times, here, take antibiotics is the first thing that the, the veterinarian says. Um, you know, we do work with integrative and holistic vets, but we can't afford them for all our dogs. So when we just go in for a standard checkup, you know, oh, 
you mentioned the dog might have had diarrhea once and it's like, oh, let's drug it, let's drug it quickly. And that begins your cycle of sickness. We know that the, the hygiene hypothesis in humans that a child under the age of three who gets a two-week dose of antibiotics can permanently damage the microbiome and is 80% more likely to develop chronic diseases such as al allergies, asthma, and other autoimmune diseases. Be that is the prime time that the microbiome is prepping its immune system. I got the opportunity to speak with Holly Gantz at Animal Biome because I was curious about the same research for animals. You know, three years, it's not gonna be three years for them to prime their immune system, their innate and adaptive immune system for, I think she said it was uh, up to six months. So there's a much shorter time. And how often do these dogs go in prior to the age of six months, especially with early spay and neuter, are given you know a course of antibiotics and the antibiotics come in many different ways it can come in your monthly heartworm it can come in in uh you know i have giardia so you want to try other uh, modalities prior to throwing antibiotics especially in their critical developmental stage that's not to say we don't use antibiotics. I mean, they are absolutely life-saving, and so are steroids, they, and we do use them, but we use them judiciously, and we use them when absolutely necessary, and we do not use them with our allergy program. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a veterinary office and it's, oh, we've got a bacterial infection. Well, we can manage bacterial infections with other modalities other than a broad spectrum antibiotic, and we have, we have, we have for many years. As far as Zuki goes, the neglect wasn't on the owner, it was on a veterinary uh, industry, a system that is broken, that is keeping our pets in a cycle of sickness. Thousands of dollars just drug, Apoquil, Ugh. every time I see Apoquil, I, I knock on three months minimum to their recovery. So the dogs that get no um, medical care and come to us bald because of you know neglect, I love those. We fix those dogs very quickly. They're, they're a straight line to recovery. When we get dogs who have this uh, lifetime of drugs, I'm worried. This is going to take us longer. Um, we had a few that have similar backgrounds. Uh, Matoshi, uh, Kisa, Saya, they were, I mean, they're immune system was devastated, it took a lot longer and, and most people would freak out and not want to go through those ups and downs. You have issues from Herxheimer reaction to us figuring out and trying to fix the underlying issues. We're inviting you along on this journey with us and it's, uh, you're not going to find that magic pill, um, but we're going to show you all the tools that you should have in your toolbox to be successful in building the optimal health of your dog. Thanks for bearing with me on a little bit of the history of the organization as well as a little bit about our six-year-old female Zuki who is, uh, you, you probably don't see it from the angle, but she's, she's in really bad shape and I'll uh, make sure there's some pictures so you can see the severity of her case. What we're actually going to talk about today isn't going to be heavily cited scientific research. We're going to keep it light. It's our first um, video. I don't want to scare people away, uh, but it is important as part of the whole environment. So um, we're going to talk about her, what she's sleeping on and what we wash her with. So she's covered in yeast. She smells really bad. If you could smell the smell. We actually have a, a HEPA air filter right over here on the other side. I should say, well, this is her private enclosed area. It's actually open and she can go in and out and go out through the doggy door, but we do want to give her that um, peace and security and um, we also want her bedding to be very particular. We can't afford to get organic <laughs> non-toxic beds for all our rescues. Um, we are a nonprofit, and uh, when we are barely scraping by you know our fosters often uh, pitch in so we can help uh, to purchase things so we do a lot of mediation and um, ideally we would have a non-toxic bedding here um, just assume all your dog bags are have a form of uh, toxins in them the synthetics just the, uh, the synthetics alone I could ha go on for hours um, what it takes in that industry is the chemicals formaldehyde the sprays the dyes uh, everything and these off gas um, you know from these beds and and the largest organ on our dog's body is their skin now typically it's uh, protected by fur 
uh, you see a little fur here, but this dog's bald. She does not have fur over all her stomach, most of her back, her legs. So she is absorbing um, any of the chemicals that might be on the bedding. We prefer to have, we use these organic 100% natural fibers. This one, uh, I believe this one's either cotton or bamboo. We're gonna talk about third-party certifications as well, which is really important. I'll get into that in a minute. So she had a bath today. We, we wanna bathe off all that um, yeast and, and the bacteria to give a chance for new beneficial bacteria to uh, grow on her skin. She's dried off with a non-toxic organic towel, and then she's brought into a clean room. Clean meaning non-toxic, not chemically uh, destroyed, no Clorox in it or anything. So we're, we're not using any harsh chemicals. We're actually not really using many chemicals at all. This was from our Amazon wish list. I want to thank, I think it was Hawker, the Shiba Inu, who sent this to us. We have a lot of these from previous allergy dogs, but they get worn after a few years. So we added this back onto our Amazon wish list. So thank you, Hawker, the Shiba Inu, who sent us these 100% organic cotton uh, washcloths that we use to um, scrub her, her skin in the shower. This is GOTS, G-O-T-S. That is Global Organic Textile Standard. This is an intense global certification by a third party that certifies the growing process, the manufacturing process, as well as the um, packaging process. In addition, they also look at child labor, labor of workers, fair trade. I mean, it's an incredible third-party certification. Looking for GOTS. Now, there's a lot of issues with synthetics, and I'll pop um, those up on the screen. You know, your, your nylons and spandex, the chemically derived. So people will tend to think, oh, your natural fibers like cotton, hemp, bamboo, silk, wool, these are all going to be a great alternative, which they are. There's less potential potential for um, contact dermatitis and allergens. However, it takes up about 5% uh, of the um, cultivated land in the world, yet it uses 24% of the world's insecticide to grow and it uses 12% of the world's pesticides. It's a very, very dirty fabric. You know, you'd want to wash all the chemicals off, but that if this was uh, your typical synthetics, you would immediately wash it because it's so concentrated with dyes and chemicals that you wouldn't want to put it right. A lot of people, they're like, oh, I have a bald allergy dog, and they'll throw clothes on the dog. Uh, not realizing that they're covering the dog in toxic material. I mean, any synthetic, ugh, get it off that dog. We try not to ever put anything on them. I had one dog that she ripped holes in her cell. We got a particular suit for, but even that, I think I used it twice. We um, try not to have anything on their skin. And if you do want to put a uh, t-shirt, try get a natural um, fiber, like cotton, hemp, silk. <laughs> going to dress your dog in silk, you know, wool's too itchy, um, cashmere, but a natural, I would say go with uh, cotton, bamboo, or hemp. Then look for a third-party certification. What are you washing it in? And this is especially the case when you spend the money to buy GOTS or 100% organic products, and then you wash it in your typical detergent and fabric softeners. I mean, there you go. You're exposing your pet to carcinogen. Leave more information because this isn't about washing i think i'll do a video on that alone but this is about what sh what we're doing to mediate her environment with cloths so we cover bedding with certified organic non-toxic no dye blankets and we regularly wash this um, she was washed this morning the blankets already covered in yeast so we tend to change this out very frequently because we don't want her sitting in her own you know gross yeast so um, we're doing a lot of washing and, and changing out of blankets after we wash uh, her body off in the shower with the organic washcloths. We then use uh, an organic towel, and I believe we've been using a bamboo one that was on our Amazon wish list. And I can't find that brand again. I have to do some research for some new ones because again, that one we're constantly washing. But you can support businesses who follow ethical guidelines and have a clean product by looking for valid third-party certification. Transparency is key with any organization. If 
there's no transparency. You might want to question what's really going on, that they don't know where their product's been or what it's been through. And as companies change hands, that's a big one. They have a lot of organizations have this halo effect where um, you associate them through good branding and marketing with ethical practices and then they're sold off and you have this halo effect. You still believe that they're this good, wholesome company. That's why I hate to um, <laughs> promote a particular company in case it gets sold. But uh, these are things you know you have to think about. In our, our we have a online support group for all our adopters, fosters, and volunteers, and uh, I've created a questionnaire to ask organizations, instead of saying, go for this brand, go for this brand, here are the questions you ask to get in writing from an organization to tell you about their practices their soup to nuts practice. How how do they operate? Um, you know, and if they aren't being transparent or willing to tell you, move along. There's many things you can do that are non-toxic. We never use sprays. We never use candles. They're horrendous. We never use plugins. These are all uh, particulate matter that can irritate most, and and they're at the ground where all the particulate matter. Um, land. So all the chemicals, especially if you spray stuff, um, they land on the ground and you know they're sniffing the ground. Um, we're standing up. We don't have as much um, exposure to these toxins and chemicals and the environmental working group has looked at our companion animals exposure to toxins and it's incredibly high. These are these are things to consider in your dog's environment. We also use uh, the cheapest, best air filtration you can get. It's called cross ventilation. Uh, it's amazing if you look at architecture for thousands of years. This was known and built into architecture, you know, before MERV filtration systems. And based on where the wind blows from the valleys, it w homes were made with the ability for cross ventilation, and that is the best way to clean out the air in your home. Of course, unless you live in a really dirty area where the outdoor air is a lot worse than the indoor air but typically if you're in like a, a decent suburb to um, rural area you want to use that cross ventilation even animals will build their burrowed homes based on where the air will flow to get that cross ventilation and, and get that clean air so some of the typical issues that you'll have from dog beds are fire retardant chemicals even if you put a blanket there is some off gassing we do use you can't see the whole room I definitely use strategic plants air filtration um, uh, some great research with NASA, a nine million dollar study into which particular plants filter which particular toxins at the highest rate. So I believe spider plants um, filter benzene, rubber plants filter formaldehyde, which is um, you know an issue with a lot of uh, dog beds and, and furniture. In the 1970s, when smoking was the thing to do in your home, people would fall asleep with their cigarettes and the house would just go up in flames because it would catch fire very quickly. And in order to counter that, they started using using fire retardant chemicals in blankets and, and couches and, and drapes, so everywhere. And one of the issues that came out of that was a high rate of mouth cancer in babies, cats, and dogs. And why would babies, cats, and dogs have mouth cancer but not the adults or the teenagers? And come to find who licks furniture, well, certainly not most normal adults, it was babies, cats, and dogs. And licking those high concentrated uh, carcinogens created mouth cancer. So there's regulations, especially for baby clothes. But today, even fighter fighters, are, there's lawsuits going on for the high rate of cancer in firefighters because of all the fire retardant chemicals that they have to wear on a daily basis. There's good and bad to everything. So we want to mediate some of uh, the bad. All of these little assaults on their body, we want to take as many of them away as we can while they're getting better so that they're their body can heal, build up their immune system, so that eventually these uh, you know, issues in the environment won't matter as much because they have such a great immune system. You know, this wasn't a big reveal. This isn't a, um, a cure-all. This isn't a panacea. This is one small aspect of a tool in a giant toolbox that we use to get our dogs back to optimal health. Next week, I'm hoping 
because she was on Apoquil before the age of one has, has basically been a series of, of drugs her whole life. She's going to take a little longer than her typical dogs to, to work with. I'm thinking about trying something different with her that should cut her recovery time in half and should be highly accessible to to our audience to everybody else i just need to um, finalize things make a few calls um, we have used this modality in our rescue for other things before but um, i'm excited to try it with an atopic dermatitis dog uh, if you have any guesses what it might be put the, it in the comments below We'll continue with our program um, that we usually do to build their immune system, but we'll probably be taking um, any of our botanical antimicrobials and antifungals out of the system. This should give you a hint because we're going to use what's called competitive exclusion. That's where the beneficial bacteria crowd out the pathogenic bacteria. But what I think we're going to be doing with her, um, I'm hoping we'll cut the time in half because uh, this is a, this is not good. I'd rather have a neglected dog that didn't have any of this. Their tra trajectory for healing is a straight line. You know, with dogs that have been on, on this much of medication, it doesn't go smoothly. I mean, we go our ups and downs. That's pretty much it for this was supposed to be short and sweet. Thanks for bearing with me for the history of the organization and the allergy program, a little bit about Zuki's story. And I hope you'll join us for future, you know, chats. Again, this isn't supposed to be a litany of scientific journal article reviews. This is just a conversation about what we are doing. And um, if you have questions, uh, ask them below. Uh, just a reminder, we cannot give out medical advice to anybody. We recommend that you go to integrative or functional veterinarian that understands about building their health, and not using um, drugs that will cover up the symptoms. Thanks for hanging out with me and Zuki, who's slept through the whole thing. I think it's going to be feeding time soon, so we get to wake up and eat. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, please consider liking, sharing, or commenting below.